Craving the taste of fresh grown tomatoes? We have a number of choices for you that are tried and true to grow in the Northland. And we tour private Duluth Peony Garden with blooms beyond compare. More coming up on this edition of Great Gardening. It really is a special environment. I love the organization of the petals. It's a Campanula, Campanula conglomerata. Hummingbirds will go there, the bees are all over the place. Urban gardening is a wonderful thing. Hello, welcome back to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. It is heating up out there, and that means the planting is happening at a furious pace. Our resident experts have been hard at work in the gardens, and we're going to put you to work here as well tonight. So it's uh, welcome to Bob Olin, regional horticulturist and educator, and Bending Birch's greenhouse owner, Tom Casper. Guys, the heat is on out there. Yeah, some beautiful days. Yeah. And Definitely. a little rain last rain. night and this Remarkable, morning. Uh, start to the season. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well, folks can call in for advice from our experts. That's thanks to our volunteers who are here tonight from the Duluth Garden Flower Society Zenith City Diggers Club. The number there is on your screen locally, 788 2844. Love those hats. Or there's a toll free number that you can call to, or you can email askgardening at WDSE. Dot o -R -G. Okay, here's this week's signs of the season. Uh, guess what? The rain barrels are filling up, and there's one in Superior. And also the rivers are getting some rain today. And the green from the leaves that are sprouting, it's definitely. It's amazing how that rain just brought things out in a hurry. A lot of the buds that were sitting there just broke, and it's just uh, it's beautiful right now. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Everything's, everything's popping out. Well, we have uh, some questions to start with already. So like I said, I'm putting you guys to work right away. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is from uh, Mary in Washburn, Wisconsin. Why does my allium start beautifully green and healthy each spring? Then after two or three weeks, the tips of the leaves begin to turn brown. That's actually pretty common to see with allium as okay. the, after they finish blooming, um, that's actually it starting to store nutrients for next year's bloom. So it's pretty common for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, generally, especially, or especially if it's in a very hot location. So if, if she's seeing that and worried and wants to prolong that a little bit, move it to a little bit shadier spot. Okay. And it's always a good idea if she's seeing those symptoms pre-bloom then it could be thrips or it could be a uh, virus infection. So in the onion family, we want to keep moving them around because they are vulnerable to a certain amount of virus attacks. So too. plant in a different, different part, of the, part garden. of the garden next year? Right, if you can keep moving moving around, then don't come in with anything else in that family, any other onions or garlic in that same area. Oh, okay. and, and you really want to move them in the fall if you're going to move them rather than the, that in the spring. So. There you go, Mary, have your work cut out for you. All right, um, Carolyn is wondering about her care of blueberries. What type of fertilizer should I use? When should I fertilize? When should I prune them? The real good question. Um, we should have fertilized before this last rain. I don't want to say that, but uh, it would have been nice. But right now they can use a little fertility. Um, ammonium sulfate is the product you want to look for. Stay away from the aluminum sulfate because of the buildup of aluminum. It will keep the soil acidic and that ammonia will be converted to nitrate that the plant can ultimately use. So ammonium sulfate uh, any time now before the next rain event. Okay. Patty from Cloquet has been planting hens and chicks and hasn't had any success. Did we read this last week? I think we did. Oh, what did you say? Um, <laughs> it's changed since last week, folks, so stay tuned. Uh, no, they're probably doing better now. <laughs> she, she said that, that the tag said good for 40 degrees and uh, she can't seem to grow them. Probably good for 40 below is what uh, oh, it should yes. say 40 below. It does say 40 below, I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so and, what's the answer? <laughs> well, very shallow rooted. Uh, if she's planting them in a location, especially during establishment, she wants to make sure she's getting them some supplemental water if she's planting them as part of an alpine garden. So be persistent with it, but take care of them for that first year, so. All right. Uh, Richard in Two Harbors has a four inch deep guard around his garden to protect against quack grass but it isn't working. Just because four inches isn't deep enough. Okay. Try eight to 10 inches and he'll have better luck. All right, there you go. 
Uh, Martin from West Duluth having trouble with Honeycrisp apples. There seem to be brown uh, tracks on the apples, uh, trails on the apples, and they are eventually destroyed. That, that's our apple maggot, if, the, if it's in the flesh he's referring to there. And uh, I just really don't like advising a spray program because that's something that you really have to stay with and it's very difficult, challenging. we got all the problem with uh, pollinators, so he has perhaps a couple options. He can bag the lower fruit with just clear poly bags, cut the bottom end off so that the water drains. He could try that. Um, you know, we used to recommend a lot of tanglefoot on red balls, but I've heard from some people that that can be dangerous to very small birds as well. Yeah, I got a, um, a comment from somebody who said that, yes, it was uh, it was killing some chickadees. Chickadees. Yeah. So yeah. I, I've not personally seen that, but I, I mm -hmm. would agree with that. So let's not uh, suggest that, but you can try... Uh, there's some very fine clays, kaolin clay, which will give you a little bit of a... Uh, it'll take some of the reddish color and some of the attraction for that fly that causes all the damage. So I think bagging kale and clay would be uh, two uh, non-chemical options or non-pesticide options that people could try. Okay. Um, Doris from Kenwood wants to know, how can I kill orange hawkweed without killing the grass too? Well, <laughs> orange hawkweed is a challenge because um, it's got what we call a, a hirsute leaf. That means it's, it's hairy. So if they're using a, an herbicide, uh, very commonly used to control broadleaves, you have to have something that will break down those beads. So you have to use an herbicide along with some kind of a, uh, a surfactant to break it down and get it in there. Then you've got to remember that uh, you want to increase the fertility because orange hawkweed really thrives on those low fer fertility arid areas and you're going to have to have a little bit more nitrogen to keep the uh, bluegrass happy. All right. Uh, Rudy from ESCO was asking about soil testing in Duluth. Um, Not done locally. Uh, that's too sophisticated. Uh, University of Wisconsin, University of <laughs> Wisconsin. <Wait. laughs> well, I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> We're not sophisticated here, Bob? Uh, actually, it's the equipment that has to be very sophisticated. And some, not the operators. He didn't mean you. He didn't no, mean no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, A little different than some of the other uh, local labs that can do certain types of testing. But if you're looking for NPK, pH, soil testing, University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, both have public labs, and then we have several uh, private labs that could do it, but they're outside, they're more in agricultural parts of the state. And, and people can go online and, and just click that and find instructions on how to send that in and have that test done. Okay, and Rick from Hibbing wants one of those raspberry lemonade nine bark, and mm -hmm. I want one too, but have you seen them around anywhere, Tom? Uh, very limited supply this year. Look for them next year to be uh, yeah. more abundant. Just so. introduced, yeah. so it might take a little, a little while. Okay, we're gonna go on to our look and our list of tomatoes. Um, they have great properties for growing in Northland Gardens. Here are a couple examples. Um, Bob, I think you said there's, what, 5,000 types of tomatoes? There are uh, at least 15,000 because they cross so readily. There are 3,000 that are in the commercial trade. When someone asked me to pick out the top 10, I was able to find 1,000 just in the catalogs My which goodness. I had access to. So we broke these down, if, if we can talk yeah, about them just ahead. a little bit into the first early and the very small fruited. These aren't the cherries, but very small fruited. And these are two of my favorites. Tumbler always comes in consistently. It works great in a hanging basket. Comes early, but it burns out kind of early as well. Fourth of July would be next in, and uh, that's a nice variety that uh, is available in the area. Then we look at our slicers. These are the determinants that are gonna grow to three to four feet in height. Very easy for a gardener to manage. Uh, Sunstar Celebrity. And the Mountain Series, we've got a couple there that have done well for us in this area, Mountain Spring, Mountain Merritt, came out of the North Carolina breeding program. There is some disease resistance. Then larger slicers, uh, Big Beef, Better Boy, Jet Star, uh, they all perform well. You'll notice that we don't have a Big Boy listed there because that's a little too late, even though it's probably okay. one of the most popular varieties in the country. And then some of our favorite uh, cherry tomatoes, Sun Gold has kind of taken the world by storm, very sweet, and here's that's what they look like. Of course, they all kind of look like that at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but very nice tangerine flavor and very nice and sweet. And then a now lot this of... this is a new category. Added the paste tomatoes this year because uh, these work so much better if you're going to make sauce uh, or if you're going to use them for canning. 
Uh, Juliet was an All-American winner. The Amish Pace, which was developed in the United States, and a couple of the others, uh, San Marzano and Tyron, which uh, have grown quite successfully, is very, very large fruited and uh, very good paste tomato. A lot of interest in health these days. One of the reasons people are gardening, uh, tomatoes do contain lycopene, which has been documented to prevent certain types of cancer. And uh, in the case of Health Kick, this is one that was promoted, actually does ripen in our area and 50% more. But if you're looking likely. for the best tasting one, what do you, you this is your favorite, taste right? Taste is always very subjective, but this is an heirloom variety, Brandywine, there are several. They uh -huh. come from the Brandywine Creek, a creek out in Pennsylvania. And uh, they're beautiful tomato, nice slicer. Uh, don't last very long, but nice and juicy and Tom, hard to be. Tom, you like, uh, you have a favorite uh, for taste? Well, uh, yeah, I brought a couple of my favorites in. I have uh, the, um, Bob had also mentioned Sun Gold. That's mm -hmm. my single favorite tomato. I mean, you can just, as they're ripening, they're wonderful. And then another heirloom. And that's a cherry. And that's a cherry. Yeah, but these are both cherry tomatoes. And an heirloom cherry uh, tomato. This is Coralic. Um, just an outstanding producer with a very sweet uh, small tomato as well that uh, is perfect actually for growing in a patio situation. Doesn't get very large but produces a lot of tomato. So Okay. And a few growing tips. I know there's a lot to know, but um, <laughs> we're going to have this stuff on our website as well. So if you just want to want to mention what we're talking about for our tips there. Yeah, uh, certainly you want short season varieties for us at 75 days. Um, you want to make sure you've got good organic material. Sufficient potassium is a driver uh, relative to the amount of nitrogen. Full sun, they are sun lovers, they're warm season crops. Give them some room, space them out so they dry down so we don't have too much problem with disease. We've got the two big categories, indeterminate, which can grow to eight feet in height. Those you want to prune back to one or two central liters. The determinants, we can stake or cage or support. We need to get them all off the ground. We need them up where the air will dry them down so we don't have as much of a problem with some of the fungal diseases. Very careful about watering. Always keep the foliage dry. Depending on your organic levels, every three to seven days, always, if you can, either water at night or very early in the morning. And then at the base of the plant, if you're watering at night, never on the foliage, just down on the ground underneath the plant. Okay, wow, we worked you hard and yet we have a bunch of questions. We're gonna keep working you. This one comes with a picture and this is about a tomato. And this came from Julie and she said that uh, this tomato plant showed up uh, as a volunteer in a pot of a rosemary, took over the, uh, killed the rosemary. It's blooming, but not setting any tomatoes. Okay, we've got bloom, which just means we're not, the fertilization isn't occurring here. You can get bloom and the, you have to have that fertility. And that may be just the lack of availability, the lack of buzz pollinators, the bumblebees and so mm. forth. She could try on the next bloom. People will use an electric toothbrush and just try to shake okay. those blooms a little bit because they are really gravity pollinated and fertilized as or opposed to Or if it's out in crossed. the wind, maybe it'll do something? Yeah, or? yeah, it's probably time for her to move that out. And certainly mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit <laughs> out of control, Julie. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so even planting it on its side and trying mm -hmm. to get some of that strength back will Oh yeah, help it talk about that, because you can do that. You can do yeah. that with a long, and can I've you got just show that real quick? Because yeah. So I'm surprised, folks, I was surprised when I heard that you can do that. Yeah, so folks <clears throat> are at the greenhouse and they're buying long leggy tomatoes, they can actually plant them on the side and they will grow up and it will give it a much sturdier plant. Yeah. Or even planting them deep sure. uh, in the soil will also help with that sturdiness. So. Excellent, okay, everybody should have a lot of good tomatoes this season, we hope. Um, here's some more questions, we got a pile of them coming in. Bruce from Duluth has an eight inch oak tree that now has uniform holes all over the trunk. What do you think that's from? Uniform would be in sap, sap sucker. What do you do about uh, those guys? Boy, if you see any <laughs> indication they're migratory, they come and they go and they flock in. So the first sign of holes, I, I would just say some kind of metal screen so they don't come in and make another series of holes. Tree will, will uh, outgrow that as long as the damage isn't too severe. Okay. <clears throat> so something like hardware cloth wrapped around those areas to sure. protect Window it, screen, so. something that's ventilated, yeah. Okay. Um, Greg from Hermantown is noticing spruce trees that have dying needles. We talked about this, Tom, off the air, and he's wondering what's happening and what can be done. Generally, a couple of funguses causing those problems, especially in blue spruce, if he's noticing that, either Cytospora or Rhizosphera, both can be significant and, and terminal. 
uh, for those trees. So if he is seeing that in his spruce trees and concerned about it, more than likely uh, has to go to a, an application of a fungicide or multiple applications of a fungicide, generally by an arborist or somebody that can uh, apply it at much higher lengths than mm -hmm. most of us can with uh, sort of our standard over-the-counter equipment, so. Okay, all right. Uh, Laura from Duluth has mites on the strawberries. Cy it says cyclamen mites, is that correct? Or That's very possible. Okay. Um, is there an organic option for those? No, as a matter of fact, uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, they shouldn't really be causing too much problems at this time. Um, even if you wanted to go to pesticides, very hard, very difficult to find labeled miticides for that particular crop. All right. You well, always, if you're having repeated problems, you know, an, an option that people have would be covering a lot of these plants with a spun polyester like Remay to prevent some of the uh, insects from actually working sure. their way in. But some of these are real challenges, particularly for the home grower. Any sense that there, it's going to be a, a bad year for that? You know, we were hopeful we didn't get a lot of uh, snow, so we had good penetration. Hopefully that eliminated some of our regular insect pests, and only okay. time will tell. A lot of this is dependent upon the weather and uh, as we progress Moving through forward, the season. Sure. And the prevailing winds, a lot of these will actually blow in on the wind stream, jet stream from oh. the southwest. So we really never know what we're going to get. Mm -hmm. Chances are we're going to get something, though. <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> Okay. Thanks. Well, it's time for a look at some of the gorgeous blooms that we saw and smelled on our visit to a large peony garden on the hillside in East Duluth. I'm Elizabeth Donnelly, and these are my gardens. I've had peonies in my life, my entire life. My grandfather was a hybridizer. We moved seven times when I was in childhood, and the last thing we packed up and put on the moving truck was our peony roots. This is uh, Kansas, which is obviously a favorite for anybody who grows it. It's awesome color, sturdy stems, tall. Kansas is a double, and Mr. Ed here is a bomb. Those are the two of the primary shapes of blooms. The difference is, is that there's two types of petals, and then a double will just look like this, same petals all the way through. And Scarlet O'Hare, who's finished blooming, is a single. So she has just one row of outer petals. Golly is pink and yellow, so it's a wonderfully joyous bomb, peony, but it's one of the last ones to bloom. This is um, Hermione which has a really sweet scent. It is um, honey gold. Look at how the bee loves it. Oh yeah, honey bee. Bonus. Mm -hmm. That's vivid rose. It smells exactly like a rose. They're pretty easy to grow, really. It's a northern plant because it needs 600 hours of below freezing temperature to bloom. I fertilize when they've come up. They get a low nitrogen fertilizer, and then when they're all finished blooming and they're all deadheaded, then they get that same fertilizer around the drip line again. And they're not gonna flower well if they struggle for water in the spring. But once they're, they're growing and even blooming, then I don't water much. Walter Maines is a very interesting peony. If you notice, his inside is confetti shaped. Chocolate Soldier is a pretty little red tuck down there. Dinner Plate is opening today, which is one of the, the last ones, and it's so dense that it will, when it's fully open, it will be the size of a dinner plate. This tree peony is called the Sun. Prometheus, it's an amazing tree peony. This is Doreen, and she's new this year. This is Angel Cheeks. A good smelling one, one of the old varieties. Everybody knows Red Charm. It's um, pink spritzer. And even though it looks like it blew up with a firecracker, that's really how it is. And this is Carol. She has almost 50 petals to every flower. So at this time of year, when the big white ones are blooming and the pale pinks, those are almost the most moving flowers. You can see the petals better than you do on the dark ones, really. And they're magic. They're, um, 
very beautiful art. They just have different personalities. Yeah. I really do like most all flowers. I guess I couldn't think of one I don't like. But the one thing about peonies is they all look different. This is an elaborate flower. That is the only peony that I have in my garden that my grandfather was um, involved in the hybridization of. It has lacquered petals. You can see how shiny they are. Helen Matthews, her petals are heart-shaped, and so we press them and then stick them in Valentine's. Wow. Well, of course, Liz and I are good friends and have been uh, gardening together for probably two decades. And yeah. Liz puts on a peony show and loves sharing her joy right. and love of peonies with the community oh. and with, with her friends and family. So yeah. stunning garden tour. It is. Beautiful. It is, yes. Very lovely. Thanks again to, to Liz for that. All right. Well, um, we have so many more questions, so we're going to get... We're going to try and get to those, but we got one that we want to go to that's got a picture because we got this from a couple of people, the same question. We saw this, saw the same thing last year at this time. What is this weed and how do I get rid of it? Yeah, if you just take a look, they're everywhere, uh, pussy toes, and it gets its name from that flower head, of course, which looks, looks like, like a, a little kitty foot. Yeah, kitty <laughs> pants of a cat. Uh, along with the orange hawkweed question ahead, we'll see them sometimes together because they're what I call poverty plants. They really are growing in areas where there's very low soil fertility. So they're not too difficult to eliminate, easier than the orange hawkweed. Uh, but if you don't improve the soil fertility uh, and maybe even add some organic material, they're just going to get reestablished again. They're perennials, so they'll come up every year in the same location unless we change the underlying characteristics of the soil. A little more organic, so mm -hmm. we hold a little bit more moisture and more nitrogen fertility so the grass can grow. Great. Uh, Celeste from Friedenberg says her azalea isn't doing anything. Will it bloom or will it bud and bloom later? Um, well, if it isn't right now, it, it's, you know, we're, we're still kind of struggling. It's been nice for a couple of days, of course, but a lot of folks' plants are still coming out. But what you'll want to do is go in and scrape the bark a little bit, see if there's any green, and also look for buds. More than likely, it sounds like the probably deer damage or a browse that's taken out of all of that growth, so. Okay. Yeah, that deer herd is very substantial out there, and they just yeah. love, that's deer candy. They love those they? buds, yep. yeah, sorry. <laughs> Dean from Duluth wants to know what vegetables are good choices for shady locations? Okay, you gotta stay away from anything really that fruits, so that would be all your leafy greens. Is, is really what you're left with there. Okay. Lettuce, lots spinach, of, lettuce, lots spinach, of salad for you. Joy, lots of, lots <laughs> of salad, yes. Okay. Um, Mary from Duluth says, we put a lot of salt out this winter and now our perennials aren't coming up yet. Uh, how do we rehabilitate the area? <clears throat> well, what you want to do, and, and last night or this morning's rain has helped with that, really flushing that through that soil. We see that in folks' lawns too as well. So getting in, flushing that well, um, maybe coming in with some compost from our, our supporters at the WLSSD or something like that to, to help improve the soil. And, and she may have to replace some of those plants if it was significant. So Okay. Couple more questions about um, the b winter burn on, on like cedars and junipers, uh, on, you know, even if they were covered. Cedar and juniper, Gosh. yeah, there's always damage, but they will grow out of that, so I'd just be a little patient with them. Let them try to grow out first before you do any pruning or shaping. Significant damage. Okay. Um, on our yeah, you've seen a lot of it. Yeah. All right. Well, we are still seeing last year's blooms in pictures on our Grow and Show feature, but this week there's some new spring flowers in the mix. Carolyn Schmidt combines some leftover topsoil and extra seeds that came from her sister in Vermont to create this improvised garden atop the beach rock at her home in Grand Marais. The chipmunk, she suspects, added the sunflowers to the mix. Judy and Lanny Nider of Barnes, Wisconsin say they know winter is truly over when they spot the native wildflowers in bloom. The fragrant Mayflower a type of anemone, commonly called liverwort, and the white flowering bloodroot. 
Judy says she doesn't pick the blooms so she can enjoy seeing them multiply over the years in their natural environment. And these lovely spring blooms from Karen Sunderman of Duluth include a variety of tulips along with daffodils and drumstick primula. If you have pictures of plants or flowers you'd like to share, send them to greatgardening at wdse.org and let us show what you grow. Keep those pictures coming in, we love seeing them. Yeah. Uh, three new calendar items, including two plant sales this weekend and a garden tour on the Iron Range. And we have all the details for you on our website where you will also find information from recent shows. We're gonna put up all that information about tomatoes. That was a lot, a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> and so hopefully people will get a chance to go online and read that. You can also find uh, complete episodes of Great Gardening for people to look. A lot of questions we didn't get to. We apologize for that, but we, we are hanging on to them and we're gonna try and get to them next week. We're also gonna be talking about dahlias next week. So we hope people can join us for that. But that's going to do it for this edition. Thanks to our phone volunteers and, of course, our sage garden advisors, Tom Casper, Bob Olin. Great work, you guys. Uh, thanks to everyone who called in with questions and to everybody out there watching from all of us here. Enjoy the garden.